Okay, now last week we began looking at archaeological discoveries during this time of the divided kingdom. And this is the time when between 930, 931 BC when Solomon died, down to the time when the Assyrians in 722 captured Samaria and ended the northern kingdom of Israel. So you had a united kingdom of Israel in 931, 930 BC. It splits. So you have Israel to the north, Judah to the south, until 722, roughly. And so we're looking at archaeological discoveries that relate to that particular period. Now, in this period of time, we've so far looked at the Shishak inscription. We looked at some an example of the ivory of Samaria. We looked at the stela of Shalmaneser III, also known as the Kirk stela. We looked at the Misha stela, also known as the Moabite stone. And we, looked at, we finished looking at the Tel Dan stela uh, right at the end of, of last week. Now I want to continue this morning looking at what's known as the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. But before I do that, I want to remind you, I, I never know who knows what about the website and what's available there. So I want to remind you that all this information, complete with the pictures of most of the artifacts that I show, it's available at my website, which is here. And so you can go and check that out, along with there are literally thousands of pages of material on other topics. And that website is, for me, I see it as part of my ministry and part of my service to Christ. And I put an awful lot of work into the material and the papers that are available there. So I want you to indulge me for just a couple of minutes. I'm going to do a real fast commercial for that website. Okay, so if you click on that link, it takes you to this charming fellow here. And you see, over here you have this, this link. If I get this guy working, you see audio and video. There's a link there. If you click that link, you go to a page that has two links. The first one will take you to the page that Bernard maintains. And that's this one. And I'm very grateful for Bernard. Bernard, on his own initiative some years ago, took to filming the classes. And he takes them and makes them available on the Internet. And I like that because it get, helps me live in the delusion that people outside this group may <laughs> actually look at them. So that encourages me and gives me hope. But that's Bernard's site right there. If you click that link or go to that URL, here you have his site where he has classes, audio and video of many classes I've done in the past that he makes available. Now from my webpage, you have that audio and video link. You click that, you go to a page that has two links. The first is to Bernard's page. The second is to the Mesa Church's page. And if you look here, if you put the cursor over, on, you have the current classes there. If you put the cursor on media, you get down here, Bible class, and you can see archaeology in the Bible, what we did on 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Then you go to previous series, and you can get some of the older ones. Okay, so that's what's there. But then back at my site, you see I've got six tabs. Basic Bible stuff, Bible studies, Bible books, creation, various groups, other stuff. If you click the basic Bible stuff tab, you get papers on these subjects. And there are varying lengths. You click the, basic, you click the Bible studies tab. I have papers, some are like 90, 100 pages, some just 10 pages. But there are, like I said, literally thousands of pages on these subjects. A note on the Mosaic Law, all kinds of things. I'm not going to read them all to you. Bible studies, papers on these subjects, papers on these subjects. It ends with the 29 lessons that I did when I walked through the story when we did that for like six months. So you have that, you have that. You click the Bible books tab, and now these are classes I've done. These are like essentially mini commentaries on these books. And so you have those, you have those, you go here, creation, things winking at me. And you have here, uh, this is the, the first one to so uh, this one, uh, this is, I think, Answers Research Journalist, where that first one is from, a lot of things. And the last one here on the creation, there, the last one is a list of its off-site where I maintain a categorized list of articles of interest to creationists. I've got, I think, 1,430-some articles that are categorized and put there. Okay, if this thing, there are various groups. You see papers on Roman Catholicism, Seventh-day Adventism, uh, Mormonism, uh, other stuff. These are reviews. Here's a review of Missing More Than Music. 
Uh, for those who wonder about instrumental music, that is a long review of a book that purported to show why we're stupid for doing that. Uh, I took issue with that and said, I don't think you quite made the case. Uh, long review, and I also have a paper on uh, music and Christian worship that you probably didn't notice when I went through the other. Uh, check it out. All right, through. That was my commercial. But uh, if you look at it, you like it, let people know about it. Uh, that would encourage me. All right, where are we? That's my commercial. Okay, after destroying the house of, of Ahab, uh, 2 Kings chapter 9 and 10, Jehu, he rules as king of Israel from 841 down to 814 B.C. Now, in 1846, a guy named Austin Henry Laird, he discovered at Kela, which is modern Nimrud, he discovered a four-sided pillar of black limestone that's about six and a half feet tall, it's known as the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Now, an obelisk is a pillar of stone that's set up as a monument, typically having four sides, and it tapers at the top. And here you see this black obelisk. And this obelisk, it, it commemorates through relief sculpture. You know where they do like little shallow carvings uh, so that you have something that comes out? These relief sculptures and through inscriptions, this commemorates the military campaign of Shalmaneser, his various campaigns of Shalmaneser III. And he says in the campaign in 841 B.C., so in that campaign, he says that he besieged Damascus, which was governed by Hatzael, and he received tribute from Jehu. So we know from Scripture, Jehu is a king in Egypt. I'm mean, Egypt. Boy, somebody shoot me. You know, it's getting old. It's terrible. He's king in Israel, and so, so Jehu is king in Israel. Now we have this, this black obelisk that mentions him, and he says he received tribute from Jehu, and we have panels that depict Israelites carrying various items of tribute to him. So this is a close-up of one of these panels, and you see here we have the, uh, he says, Shalmaneser says in this, in this depiction, he says it shows Jehu, and it's actually probably one of his ambassadors. And I say one, probably one of his ambassadors because his dress isn't really distinctive, which you would expect if that was actually uh, Jehu himself. But it shows Jehu or his ambassador bowing before Shalmaneser. And the inscription identifies the supplicant, the one who's bowing, as Jehu, son of Omri. So here we have this external confirmation of the kingship of Jehu in Israel, and it says, I received from him silver, gold, a golden saplu bowl, not sure what that is, a golden vase with pointed bottom, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king, and a wooden perutu. Don't know what that is either. But he says he received these things from him. Now Jehu's paying tribute to Shalmaneser. That's not mentioned in Scripture. But there are a lot of things not mentioned in Scripture. See, God is telling a story in Scripture that's relevant to us. This isn't mentioned, but it seems that, that Jehu opted as a new king, because this is right when he becomes king. So we see here that you have Shalmaneser saying that he's paying tribute. He commemorates that. So it looks like he decided as a new king that he would go ahead and buy peace with Assyria rather than engage them in war. So he comes to the throne and he's thinking, I better go and placate the Assyrians so they don't come and want to jump on me. So he goes and he pays them some money and this kind of thing. Now he's called the son of Omri, not because he's a descendant of Omri, but because the Assyrians were so impressed with King Omri. And you can read about King Omri in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 15 to 29. He made such an impression on them that all subsequent rulers in Israel were in Assyria identified with Omri. The house of Omri, that became the Assyrian name for the land of Israel. That's how they referred to it, the house of Omri. And so he says he's a, he's a son of Omri and that he's a ruler of Israel. That's what he means by that. Now Jehoash... You remember you have Jehoash and you have short and long forms of these names. Uh, that's not something somebody made up. That's the truth. They have so Jehoash, who would also be known as Joash. He's king of Israel, not to be confused with the 
Joash or Jehoash who served as king of Judah. Pat was asking me about that last week, and they have different different lineage, different parents, and they're identified in Scripture. So you have Jehoash, who's the king of Israel. He's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 13. Now, he reigned from around 798 to 782 B.C., and a 51-inch high stela was discovered in 1967 at Tel Rima in Iraq, which recounts military efforts of the Assyrian king Adad Narari III. So here's this Assyrian king. He's got this stela. He's commemorating his military campaigns. He reigned from around 810 to 782. So covering this period of time of Jehoash, king of Israel. And the inscription says, here you have it. The inscription says, Adad Narari received the tribute of Joash of Samaria. So here we have this Assyrian mentioning this Israelite king that we have here in Scripture right at the time he's ruling. So we have that, that confirmation. This probably occurred during Adad Narari's Western campaign. But this, Adad Narari's Western campaign, 796, that's probably when he, he took this uh, tribute, or received that tribute from Joash the king or Jehoash king of Israel. Now the 8th century B.C., so we're talking from 800 B.C. down to 700 B.C. See, because when you come in this way, that's how that works. So 800 down to 700. The 8th century B.C., this ushered in really prosperous times for both Israel in the north and Judah in the south. You have Jeroboam II. You remember Jeroboam I? He was the first king there, 931, 930 at the split. You get Jeroboam. Well, this is Jeroboam II. And he reigns in Israel from 793 to 753. And in Judah, you have Uzziah, who's also known as Azariah. So you have King Uzziah reigning in Judah. He ruled there from 792 to 740. Now, Assyria, who's under their king, added Nerari III, 810 to 782 B.C. He vanquished Damascus in 802 B.C. And that's very significant because Damascus had been somebody dominating the northern kingdom of Israel. So when the Assyrian comes in and vanquishes Damascus, that relieves Israel from that pressure and that domination. And then in the first part of the 8th century BC, the Assyrians began to fade temporarily in significance. There was a temporary retreat, so they were no longer pushing and being as aggressive as they were. The combination of their uh, vanquishing Syria, so it would no longer dominate Israel, and their shrinking temporarily in their own aggressiveness, that then led to this flourishing in the 8th century BC of both the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. So here they had, they prospered, the kingdoms prospered financially, they expanded their borders, and they brought both Israel and Judah to a prominence that was second only to Solomon's golden age. So this is the good times are rolling in the 8th century for these places. Now, an ancient seal, you may know this, but let me say it in case you don't. An ancient seal, uh, it's a stamp or an engraving of either a, a design or an inscription that is cut into something, some hard substance like stone or metal, and it's used to make an impression in something soft like clay or wax. And it functioned like a signature. It would be like if I had a stamp of my signature and I put it on stuff. It's like me signing it. Well, that's how they use these seals. They were unique to the person. And whether it's, whether it's an inscription or whether it's a design, they were identified with that person. So when he pressed it into clay or wax, it was basically saying, look, it's a sign of authenticity or ownership. Like, I'm signing this thing. And that's how those things functioned. Well, in excavations in Megiddo in 1904, Gottlieb Schumacher, he uncovered a large and beautifully made jasper seal. Now, you might be saying that doesn't look jasper. No, it doesn't. Uh, there's a story there that I'll tell you in a second. But he uncovered this large and beautifully made jasper seal that from the style of the inscribed letters, that's what these people who specialize in this kind of stuff can do. They can see and say, okay, I'm going to look and determine 
when was this made? But from the style of the inscribed letters, it was dated to the early 8th century B.C. Okay, so we're right in the time here of Jeroboam II. And above the roaring lion is the name of the seal's owner. And below the roaring lion, lion is the title of belonging to Shema, servant of Jeroboam. So here we have, right from this time, we have a seal of somebody who was the servant of Jeroboam. Now, he was evidently a high official in the administration of Jeroboam II, but since he's not mentioned in the Bible, we don't know what his duties were. Now, why does this seal not look like Jasper? Well, because when the original Jasper seal was sent to the Turkish sultan, sultan in Istanbul, uh, they made a bronze cast of it before they sent it. But after they sent it, it disappeared. So they were, they were wise. I guess they understood that risk. So we're going to send this nice seal over here. Anyway, they made the bronze cast of it, sent it, the seal disappeared, and now you have the bronze cast, which is in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. So there we have this person, this Jeroboam. We have external confirmation of Jeroboam's reign. Now, there are two ancient seals that mention Uzziah, as I say, also known as Azariah. There are two ancient seals that mention him, both of which are from of unknown origin. And they're in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Now, one is a ring seal that's made of agate, and it measures a little over half an inch by a little less than half an inch. So a small little thing, and it has an Egyptian motif here, and the inscription says, belonging to Abiah, servant of Uzziah. And so here we have this inscription there, and then the other one is a two-sided seal. That's almost an inch by a little over, over a half inch, about two-thirds of an inch. And here I just have a drawing of this. But you see here it's the two-sided seal. And the side with the man carrying the staff, it has the name Shebaniah. And on the other side it says, Belonging to Shebaniah, servant of Uzziah. So here we have these kings, king of Judah, king of Israel. You get these seals of people who are working in their administration that wind up, uh, we wind up having. Now, Uzziah, interestingly, he's also mentioned in an, in an inscription that dates from 130 B.C. to A.D. 70. So sometime in that frame, so hundreds of years after Uzziah's death. But he's mentioned in an inscription that's part of the Antiquities Collection at the Russian convent on the Mount of Olives. It was purchased in the late 1800s. And that inscription says, Here were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah. Do not open. And so that's just an inscription somewhere, whether there was something that kept Uzziah's bones, but why? what is this doing so many centuries uh, after Uzziah had been interred? Well, people speculate, and they think, well, maybe because he was a leper. You know, from 2 Chronicles 26, 21, and 23, maybe something happened with the thought process many centuries later. Somebody said, well, listen, he, he would be unclean, and he needed then to be moved outside the city of David. So we don't know that. What we know is we got this thing, and we know when this thing came. So you're saying, for some reason, somebody felt necessary to move his bones, and so that's as decent a speculation as you can come up with. Now, 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 19 and 20, it reports that Menachem, now, he was king of Israel from around 752 to 742 B.C. It says that he, he paid the Assyrian king Pul, P-U-L. But we know from elsewhere, the, the Assyrian king Pul, this is Tiglath Pileser III. So we see in Scripture, in 2 Kings 15, 19 and 20, that Menachem pays Tiglath Pileser a thousand talents of silver. So we have that there in Scripture. Now, the so-called annals of Tiglath Pileser, which are these inscriptions on this uh, inscribed clay, uh, clay tablets, they were discovered by Austin Laird at Kala, which is modern Nimrud. They were discovered in 1845. All right, they, they were discovered in 1845, and they say that Tiglath Pileser received tribute from Menachem of Samaria. So here scripture says he paid him a thousand talents of silver. 
we have an external confirmation where he says he received tribute from Menachem of Samaria. He also received tribute from others. And it includes, by the way, in the itemization of the collective tribute that was paid, it includes silver. So we have scripture saying he paid a thousand talents of silver. We have the king saying, I received tribute from Menachem of, of uh, Samaria. And then he includes in the list of tribute he received, not only from him, but from other people, he includes silver in that. So I think that's a pretty interesting tie. 2 Kings chapter 16. You have the Judean king Ahaz. Well, he's attacked. He's attacked by the king of Israel, Pekah, and Rezin, who's the king of Syria. Not Assyria, the king of Syria. So those two together, they come and attack the Judean king Ahaz, presumably to force him to join their alliance against Assyria. So we've got the king of Israel and the king of Syria fighting against the king of Judah because they want the king of Judah to join their alliance against the Assyrians. So that's what's going on there. Now the chronology of Ahaz's reign is a little more difficult than some to piece together, but it seems to have run from 735 to 715 with part of the time involving various co-regencies. If you look up above, you see he would have been co-regent with Jotham for a while, and then with the young Hezekiah would have had a long co-regency there. But around 734 B.C., he appeals to Assyria for help. Right? You've got Pekah, and you've got the king of Syria. They're coming after him. And he goes and he appeals to the Assyrians. He wants help. It is noted in 2 Kings chapter 16, he sends them silver and gold. And he agrees to become an Assyrian vassal, somebody who would be subject to the Assyrians. Well, a building inscription from Tiglath Pileser's reign, it lists among those from whom he received tribute, Jehoahaz, which is the long form of Ahaz. He has Jehoahaz of Judah. So here we have this external confirmation of what we see in 2 Kings 16. He says, I was paying tribute. I agreed to become a vassal. And we go find inscriptions from Tiglath Pileser. And he says, I'm taking stuff from this guy. Just as scripture says. Now here's a reproduction of that section of text that was published in the 1860s by a man named Henry, Henry Rawlinson in a publication, The Cuneiform Inscriptions of Western Asia, this is in volume 2, a selection from the miscellaneous inscriptions of Assyria. Now, I know you can read that. <laughs> Always looks to me like little trumpets, you know. But there's, there's this text where you have him saying that, that he uh, took tribute from Jehoahaz of Judah. And uh, all right, Now, Tiglath Pileser, well, he's happy to get this word. You see, when you have, when you have Ahaz saying, hey, I give you money, I'll, I'll serve you, come here and help me against these people who are piling up on me and trying to get me to go against you. Of course, God wasn't too happy with Ahaz going to Assyria and doing this. But he did it. And we have, it, we have this confirmation. But Tiglath Pileser gladly responded to Ahaz's request. Oh, sure. I, yeah, you, you need me to come in there and help out? I'll be glad to do that. And we see here in 2 Kings 15, 29, it says, In the days of Pekah, king of Israel... Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ijon, Abel Beth Maka, Genoa, Kedesh, Hatzer, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. And he carried the people captive to Assyria. So we have that. Well, this invasion, that invasion is recorded in the annals of Tiglath Pileser, his annals for the year 733 to 732. Right when this is going on, right when the Bible says this, we have his annals documenting his campaign and his success there. He says he took the inhabitants of Israel, which he calls Omri land. Remember they were so impressed with Omri? He took the inhabitants of Israel, Omri land, to Assyria. Well, let's see, people captive to Assyria. That's what he says he did. And he mentioned some towns in Galilee. And there is a relief scene which shows his capture of Ashtaroth, 
Here it celebrates his capture. These things are bigger than this, but this is a, you get a picture. So here's Tiglath Pileser in this great victory, and they're celebrating his victory over Ashtaroth. And Ashtaroth is a town east of the Sea of Galilee. So you have him listing a number of places in Galilee. You have him saying, we carted people off to Assyria right when Ahaz is doing this. And of course, he's not a big, big fan of, uh, of Judah, by the way, Tiglath Pileser. Well, Tiglath Pileser, he also says in his annals that they, the Israelites, he says they overthrew Pekah and that he placed Hoshea as king over them. So he says here the people, they went and they replaced this king. They got rid of Pekah. The Israelites got rid of Pekah. Well, that fits very nicely with the report in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 30, that Hoshea struck down Pekah at that time. If he's in league with the Assyrian and he wipes out Pekah, well, you can see the Assyrian saying, yeah, I took him out. You know, I did that through Hoshea. And so you wind, up, you, you, you wind up having that connection there. And as I said, Tiglath Pileser, he was no friend of Judah. You know, this is, this is going on in Israel. He's no friend of Judah. And you can see that in 2 Chronicles 28, 16 to 21. Now in 1998, uh, archaeologist guy named Robert Deutsch. Deutsch published a reddish-brown seal. First you'll see this is from the time of Ahaz. But he published a reddish brown seal. And actually, it's a bulla instead of a seal. You see, a bulla is you have clay, and then the seal gets pressed into the clay. And so for documents, you will have a clay a blob on there, and then I will put my seal into it. And usually the clay then dries in the air, and it becomes quite hard. But sometimes if the documents are in a place where it gets burned up, then what happens is the clay that has the imprint in it is essentially fired like pottery, and it becomes almost indestructible. That's how these things survive so long. So you have this, it's really a bulla, but you see it has the imprint of the seal in it. So he finds, in 1998, he published a reddish-brown bulla that says it, it's from a private collection, and it has the following inscription. It says, Ahaz, son of Jehotham, which is the long form again of Jotham, king of Judah. So here we have, and we have this seal here. You see, it, it speaks of both Ahaz. We get Ahaz, and we get a mention of Ahaz's father, Jotham. Right here on, on a seal. You say, well, you know, these people are just making this stuff up. Well, then what are they doing? They're also going out making up seals and planting them? Here, here you know, in the right time frame? But you have people who think all kinds of things. Now, he also published another seal from Ahaz's reign. This one is a seal. He published it that says, Ushna, servant of Ahaz. So here we have another seal that mentions Ahaz. And in fact, Ahaz is also mentioned in a seal that names him as the father of Hezekiah. But I'll get to that in a bit. But you see, Ahaz mentioned in a number of these seals that we actually have. Now, Hoshea... Hoshea is the last king of the northern kingdom. He rules from 732 to 722. And in 1995, that epigrapher, uh, Andre Lemaire, Andre Lemaire published a seal from a private collection that was dated by the, the style of the seal and the iconography on it, which is, like I say, people who play in this world, they can distinguish styles. And so it was dated from those things to around 750 to 722 B.C. It measures about an inch by two-thirds of an inch. And it has a Hebrew inscription on it that says, Belonging to Abdi, servant or minister of Hoshea. So here we have somebody who's in the administration of the last king of the northern kingdom. We have a seal that identifies and mentions this person. So that's something that I think is worth noting. Now, Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, it mentions that the Philistine city of Ashdod says it was captured by a military commander who was sent by Sargon, king of Assyria. So you see that in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. 
Now, this is the only place in ancient literature where an Assyrian king named Sargon is mentioned. And for that reason, you had all kinds of geniuses insisting that Sargon was mythical, that Sargon had simply been created, that he was a, you know, somebody from the imagination of the Bible writers. Well, that lasted until 1843. When a man named Paul Bota discovered in Dur Shurukin, which is modern Khorsabad, about 12 miles northeast of Nineveh, he discovered a large palace that Sargon had begun building. And that site that was extensively, that was in 1843, that site was extensively reinvestigated almost a century later by the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. And additional texts and inscriptions were uncovered at that time. Now the entrance to the throne room of this palace that the non-existent Sargon was building, the entrance to that throne room was guarded by a massive pair of human-headed winged bulls. These things are 14 feet high. And there they are before the throne room of Sargon's palace. And there's an inscription there that refers to Sargon as conqueror of Samaria and the entire country of Israel. So you have, you have here Sargon. Now the attack on Ashdod that was reported in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1, that occurred around 712 B.C., that's also confirmed in various inscriptions from Khorsabad. So we not only have Isaiah saying that, Sargon sent this military commander. Sargon, no, he doesn't exist because we haven't seen him anywhere other than that stupid Bible. Well, then we find out, well, what do you know? There is a Sargon who's building. We have the palace he's building. And by the way, we now have inscriptions that talk about the very attack in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. So, 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 6. That reports the fall of Samaria. You know the history here, the Assyrians. And this is probably 722. Now somebody might put it 723, somebody in 721. Okay, but right, right around then you have the Assyrians who finish off the northern kingdom of Israel in conquering Samaria. And Sargon, he succeeded Shalmaneser V as the king of Assyria right around that time. You see, right around the time the Assyrians are finishing their conquest and capturing Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom, right around that time you have this change in kingship. So there's some uncertainty about Sargon's role in the actual fall of Samaria. Was he there as commander? Was he there, had he already become king? Because you're right in that crack. But it's clear that Sargon, he certainly claims credit for taking, taking over Samaria. That's what you read in the inscription there where, he's, where he says here, conqueror of Samaria. See, so he certainly, years later, he's taking credit for it, whether he deserved that or not. And he was involved in it. But so that's just a little wrinkle on the, on the chronology and the timing. Now I want to talk about the, the southern kingdom alone. Okay, we've been looking at, in the period of the, uh, you have the two kingdoms, the divided kingdom, from 931, 930 down to 722. After the Assyrians end Israel, we then have Judah goes on alone until 587 when the Babylonians come and end Judah. So I now want to look at archaeological finds that relate to that period of the uh, southern kingdom alone, 722 to 587 B.C. And first in 2 Kings 18 verse 7, it says that Hezekiah, king of Judah, that he rebelled against the king of Assyria. So we have that in Scripture. And 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 13, reports that in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, who was king of Assyria from around 704 B.C. to 681 B.C., that he captured fortified cities of Judah. So we have Scripture saying Hezekiah rebelled, and then scripture telling us that the king of Assyria comes in and he captures fortified cities in Judah. Now, Hezekiah, 
He sent word to Sennacherib when Sennacherib was in Lachish confessing that he'd done wrong and offering to pay tribute to Sennacherib because the handwriting as he saw it was on the wall and he's saying, "Uh uh-oh. So here, he sends word to him at Lachish, one of the fortified cities have been captured, and he says, listen, I will pay tribute, whatever tribute you impose. And Sennacherib demands from him, you give me 300 talents of silver, you give me 30 talents of gold, and a talent's about 75 pounds. So he says, you give this to me. And, he, and Hezekiah then goes and he says, okay, Hezekiah sends all that he could come up with from the temple and from the palace. And you see that in 2 Kings 18, 14 to 16. And Sennacherib's apparently not happy with that. You see, it's like, you know, he's holding all the cards. He says, yeah, you send me this stuff. He sends him stuff. And he says, eh, not good enough. I'm still coming. Okay, so Sennacherib's apparently not happy with what he was saying. He wasn't satisfied. And he sends envoys to Hezekiah, urging the people to surrender. You remember the story. Urging them to surrender the city or else face destruction. That's in 2 Kings 18, 17 to 35. Well, after another threat from Sennacherib, 2 Kings 19, verses 8 to 13, Isaiah comes and he assures Hezekiah in, in 2 Kings 19, 32 to 34, that Sennacherib would not lay siege to the city and that he would leave because God was going to defend the city. And that night, an angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrians. And you see that also in Second Chronicles verse 32. I'll give you a footnote. Unless this is that numerical hyperbole, then we'd be looking at 18,500. If there's anything to what David Fouts had said that I mentioned weeks ago. Okay? But anyway, God... Is that second bell or first? Good. God has, he winds up, he, he kills a ton of people, Assyrians, okay? And he winds up then defending and protecting the city. Well, in 1830, that's all Bible, all right? That's what the Bible tells us. And in 1830, this British colonel named R. Taylor, he discovers a six-sided prism in Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh, which is now, it's known as the Taylor Prism. And it's an account of Sennacherib's invasion of Judah and his taking of fortified cities, thus confirming the report in Scripture that the king of Israel came, of of Assyria, came and took fortified cities in Judah. So you have him saying that. Now, other copies of that prism have been found. They're known as the Nimrud prism and also known as the Oriental Institute prism. Well, Sennacherib in this prism... He refers to Hezekiah the Jew and he declares that he made him a prisoner in Jerusalem. He says that he, like a bird in a cage, having surrounded him with watchtowers in order to molest those who were leaving the city's gate. But what is striking, he makes no actual claim to having laid siege to the city or to having captured it. Now you know how these guys roll. Do you think if he had captured the capital city of Judah that he'd have been silent about that? I find that that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. He makes no claim about that. You know, given how these guys brag, that would have been everywhere. And you can bet that if he had suffered a humiliating defeat, he would turn that sow's ear into a silk purse or he would be silent about it. He's not going to sit here and say, by the way, I hate to confess, people on this monument that will be there of me forever, he thinks, uh, that I got, you know, beat up. That's not going to happen. So it is very significant. You see that he doesn't say he actually laid siege. It says he builds these earthworks, watchtowers, to watch and molest the people. But not siege works where he's actually assaulting the city. Now it seems clear from their various chronological links that this campaign of Sennacherib just took place in 701 B.C., and you can say, you can read the chronological data saying, well, that, that may conflict with some of the points that we see information in Scripture relating to the reigns of the Judean kings. But it need not. You see, it's quite possible that Hezekiah's reign began in 715 as his sole reign. In other words, he came to the throne in 728 as a boy. But his soul reign begins with the death of his predecessor in 715. And if you're counting from his soul reign, 
then the 14th year from his sole reign would be 701, which is exactly what is the date that Sennacherib comes. So see, I, I, don't, I just alert you to that, because sometimes when you read around, you say, oh, you see, that doesn't work. Au contraire. You see, keep reading. You see, keep reading and you'll see. So in that case, it would work out. Now, interestingly, Sennacherib claims to have received from Hezekiah. He claims to have received from Hezekiah 30 talents of gold. Now, that is the precise amount that Scripture says he demanded that Hezekiah pay. You remember Hezekiah sends people up to Lachish? I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I messed up. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. What do you want? I want 30 talents of gold. We now have records of Sennacherib saying that he received 30 talents of gold from Hezekiah. Now, there's a little wrinkle here because in terms of silver... He says, I received 800 talents of silver, precious stones, antimony or antimony, large cuts of red stone, couches inlaid with ivory, and the medu chairs, don't know what that is, inlaid with ivory, elephant hides, ebony wood, boxwood, and all kinds of valuable treasures. And you say, well, wait a minute. He, he's got the exact amount of the, gold of, of the gold here, but he wanted 300 talents of silver, and he's talking now about 800 talents of silver. Well, there are a couple of ways of looking at that. It may be that the 800 talents that Sennacherib reports includes not just the silver, but it includes all this other stuff that he piled on. So what it looks like to me is he was deficient in silver. He didn't have the silver that he needed, so to make up for that, he piles on less precious items hoping that would appease him. And so he simply says, I got 800 talents of silver, this, 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 this. So it could include all. But it also could just be a transmission error on the Assyrian side. You see, why would we think that the Assyrians, you know, so maybe something got garbled in the recording of how much silver did he actually give. But anyway, I, I just find the fact you got the gold nose on, and then you have this other report about silver, and you have that there, he includes that, and then talks about the amount. I just look at all of these things, all of these contacts, and I just think it's cool. Thanks for coming.